Hello, everyone, and welcome at our presentations on Visions, an open source library for semantic data. Uh, my name is Simon Brugman, and I'm presenting it with Ian Eves. Um, so let's start off with defining some terms. So we're talking about data types, and one way to view data types is as being defined by a set of possible values. And um, intuitively, we can understand uh, semantic types as something we're working with every day. So if you think about names or countries, they are all abstract, or, um, abstract meanings of sequences of data, um, a probability as well. But when we're moving into the realm of computation, these have to become real types that the computer can reason with. And that's a machine representation, which you're probably familiar with. For example, the way that a database represents uh, represents the data, or pandas does, in an integer or a float or a uh, Farchar type. And in the next slide, we will see how these relate. So these types are not exclusive. Uh, for example, if you have normally distributed numbers, the database or the machine will represent it as a float. For the binomials as an integer, words starting with an S can be represented as strings. And the answer to life, the universe, and everything can be stored in an integer. So these are not ex uh, exclusive. They are not in, in conflict. They may work together. And we invest a lot of effort and time about optimizing and thinking about how to use this machine representation. But the semantic representation will actually uh, help us make better programs. So why do semantics matter? Now, for example, this, uh, this case, this headline, you might have seen it, where scientists had to actually rename human genes uh, to prevent Excel from misreading them as dates. So these were March 1 and Sept, uh, Sept 1. And um, this is not incidental. The past year alone, 27 genes had to be changed uh, like this. Uh, in uh, by the, the human uh, gene nomenclature committee yes next slide um, so why is this important so first the semantic types as i already mentioned drive application logic if you're uh, writing applications that are data intensive you will need it however in the python uh, environment there's no out of the box solution for this and if you don't use the right abstraction then it's becoming a mess real quick. It's really easy to, to write convoluted code. Where would you need it? You would need this anywhere that you use abstract typing on a sequence of data. So this can be data cleaning, auto ML, data profiling, data compression, and many more examples. And what we are talking about is visions, which is a framework that allows you to model the data, the semantic data types, and do type detection. So this example is an example in Pandas where you have a sequence of integers, one, two, three, and four. However, once you add one single string, so four as a string, then the memory usage will increase because it's automatically concourse to an object. And what we're talking about is the, the kind of logic to prevent and solve these cases, because this is what you would encounter in real life. So, the next slide will then. So this is um, a way that typically everyone solves this by a sequence of checks. And uh, these sequence of checks are in pandas, in dasks. And um, yeah, the, there's an order dependency here it, uh, and it doesn't scale. And these are the things that you will run into when you're defining this logic. Another reason why we're doing it is uh, because we've noticed, but also others have noticed the importance of this sem uh, semantic detection. For example, Hulsebos et al. say that the detection of semantic types is crucial for data science tasks, such as automatic data cleaning. And uh, they're shared by many. So this is uh, from MIT, but there's also Microsoft, uh, the UMass, and uh, Wes McKinney also mentioned this in the uh, documentation of need for PANAS 2.0. Well, what's available currently, uh, we've seen before, you can use uh, apply this ad hoc uh, logic, but we are more interested in automating this or making it more efficient. Uh, there's of course a built-in inference in uh, open source tools, but it's uh, it doesn't allow to 
customize. And we've seen also before that it's tricky when you have, for example, one string item. And we have also looked at commercial software, where, for example, Power BI, Ta Tableau, and Trifacta, they, they have a limited support for a custom type, no support for custom type, but limited support for semantic types, which are, for example, in Tableau dependent on the, on the headers and not on the values. In terms of where you would apply this, um, you can think of Pandas profiling for exploratory data analysis. We're actually using it um, for great expectation, which is a library to generate data validation rules uh, called expectations. You could map the semantic types automatically to, uh, to these rules. Uh, similarly for Popmon, which does validation over time, uh, model monitoring, data monitoring. We've also used it in Compressio to uh, make efficient compression of your dan Pandas data frames. You can also use it for data clean in many more other applications. Moving to what, what is Visions? Visions is a package we've built, which aims to make logic explicit and expressive to allow the user to make composable, uh, composable modeling of their problem in a graphical structure. Um, the user has to be able to write performance code and we support type inference detection and casting out of the box with a simple API. And now I'm handing over to Ian who will introduce the concepts and vision. Thanks, Simon. So in order to make visions work, we really need to understand three basic concepts. The first, types. This, is, this corresponds to everything Simon was just discussing. These, these are semantic or logical abstract understandings of the values and meaning of our data. Now, it, when we're actually implementing this, Visions requires two fundamental um, elements. The first, a class which inherits from Visions base type, right? Um, coming along with, with that inheritance is a variety of um, default capabilities, um, out of, you know, support for set type operations, um, a whole host of other capabilities. Uh, but truly what's required is a contains operation. So this is a function which takes as its input a sequence and evaluates whether that sequence is of the abstract type um, defining it. So in the generic case, generic is kind of a universal set. It is the, uh, the type that all sequences belong to. So if we say the sequence, hello world sequence, um, is that a member of generic, S in generic, that evaluates to true. Types can kind of be visualized in this sort of, um, of set-based perspective. Uh, and probably this set-based perspective is something most of you are already familiar with. So within the context of generic, kind of a universal set, uh, we have numeric values, uh, which themselves break down into continuous and discrete. You might have the sequence one, two, and three as a, an instance of a discrete value where um, the, the sequence 1.1, 2.2, 3.3 might be continuous, the difference between interval versus um, not. Similarly, we have categories. And these break down maybe into um, those that are ordered, so ordinal, or uh, those that are not ordered, so nominal. Um, that would be like cat, dog, cat, right? There's no inherent order to cats and dogs. Now, it's not enough to only talk about types, though. Right? What's interesting is how these types relate to each other. Um, you know, we saw a number of examples earlier where one type, uh, where we had a type of data where Maybe it was a string encoding an integer, but we weren't so much interested in it as a string. We wanted to do something with its numeric properties. Um, in that case, we add one new method. So here we, we have an implementation of string that you, you might see in Vision, something similar to this. Um, our contains op is only slightly changed. Now we're checking whether each value is itself a string. Um, but we've added a new, a new method. That's this get relations method. And that's gonna return a list of relations. Now, critically within visions, uh, the, the, the mechanism of relating types is a little bit different than is usually intuitive and found in most applications. So most people think, you know, if I have a sequence of strings, one, two, three, 
uh, I might try to coerce that to other things. So I might make that, I might try making that first a float, or I might first try making that an integer or so on. I'm gonna go through a list of options. Um, so that's mapping from the type of the sequence to another type. Visions does the reverse. So it asks the question, um, how can I map uh, to myself? So if I'm a string, what can I, what can I convert to me? Um, that might be you know, generic becoming string. That might be um, you know, an integer coming from string. So <clears throat> that also uh, it kind of inherently produces two possibilities. We might either do that without transforming the underlying data in the case of generic becoming string, or we might have to change the underlying data in case of string becoming integer. That difference is the difference between what visions calls an identity relation and an inference relation. So identity relations, no change to the data, no transformation. Inference relations do require a change. Um, so here we, we have the example of an integer and we have a relationship between integer and string uh, that requires a conditional mapping. So first there's a test whether that transformation is applicable. We might attempt the coercion. If it succeeds, then we would say it is. Uh, and second, a transformation, which actually modifies the, the underlying data. Going back to our, our set view, you know, this would be akin to saying or observing, I have the sequence one, two, three encoded as string. And I see intuitively and in looking at this that I can apply integer to that sequence uh, and get the discrete numeric value uh, one, two, three as integers. Um, first, I would attempt the coercion, that is the conditional element, and then I would actually perform the coercion, uh, creating a conditional mapping or inference relation. The third and final piece is the type set. And this is really just building up all of the pieces we've, we've already uh, established. So a type set is at its most primitive, a directed asymptotic gra graph, right? So it is this, the relationship between a set of types. Because we've defined relationships in the way that we have, they have become composable. We can add them together. And in fact, Vision supports exactly that sort of uh, API. You can add, subtract types from a type set at will, and it will reconfigure the graph on the back end on the fly. So, um, with all of those pieces, we get three new fundamental capabilities. Um, type set, type detection, and type inference. These are the two sides of the relation coin, so the identity relation and the inference relation. Type detection is determining the type of a sequence absent any transformation, so not no changes to the underlying data. If I give you the, the sequence one, two, three as encoded as strings, then I would expect that to be uh, returned a type of string. Uh, on the other hand, inference permits uh, transformation throughout the graph. So in that case, we should say, you know, if I infer the type, I, I would get um, a more specific representation, which is one, two, three as integers. Casting is, is basically the same as inference, except rather than returning the type, I'm getting the actual, uh, the actual values of the sequence, of the, the core sequence. And all of these correspond to traversal around uh, or, or along a graph, along the graph that corresponds to our type set. So this is a, a really uh, simple visualization, hopefully, of the complete set uh, within Visions. You can import that right now. Um, and let's just do a quick example. So, so we get the, the series uh, consists of a sequence of dates encoded as uh, strings uh, and a missing value indicator, none. Uh, by default, it's already generic. We can tell that because generic is uh, the universal set, right? It's the type that everything else belongs to. Um, and what we're gonna do is just try each type, uh, each child node that is, uh, of the current type of the sequence. So we know it's generic. Uh, we'll try categorical, Boolean, complex, whatever it's related to. Now that does correspond to, to one observation it's important to keep in mind. In order for the traversal of this graph to be deterministic, 
uh, the relationships between child nodes in the graph have to be disjoint. So I can't have a sequence that's both Boolean and complex at the same time. Uh, this is not required for visions to work, but it is required to have a deterministic traversal. All right, so let's just do this quickly. Um, first, we might try something like categorical. We'd see that the, the sequence S, it's it encoded as a, a pandas object. So it's not going to correspond to the pandas category. These are two different uh, physical implementations of the same data. Uh, so this would be false. It's not a categorical. Okay, so we'll have to try another type. I'm gonna try object next and we'll see that, ah, yes. So because our sequence is string, uh, pandas encodes that as an object. If we check for it to be an object, uh, that will be true. We can now traverse to the next layer of the graph and determine that our D type is at least object. Mm -hmm. We'll attempt one more layer down, one more child, and see string intuitively again. Our sequence is currently encoded as a string, so that will be true. We can traverse again. And now we had another uh, kind of bifurcation. You might have noticed already that there are two types of lines on this graph, solid and dashed. Solid corresponds to identity relations. Again, no transformation to the underlying data. Dashed corresponds to inference relations, transformations to the underlying data. Every child node of string is an inference relation. So that means we're gonna to have to do something a little bit different here, but let's, let's proceed and we'll hit it in a second. Okay, first, maybe we try complex. We see that it's not complex. We try coercing the, the value 1937-5-6, that fails. So it's not complex. We'll try date time next and we'll see that, ah, yes, we can coerce all of those values to date time objects. That's true. Now we have to perform a transformation though. So before we can say that our, because our date time object is defined assuming actual date times under the hood, we have to transform our string into its representation um, presumed by the type. So that involves an additional transformation step here. We transform the sequence of date time encoded strings to the sequence of date times with a uh, pandas missing value, missing time indicator in AT. There's one child left. We basically perform the same process. We see that date uh, is effectively a date time where the time values are zero. And that is the case in our example. Um, so we'll transform again and we'll end up with our final type of date and our final series of dates um, with say in the first value, the year 1937, the month five and the day six. That'll hand it back to Simon. Yes, thank you, Ian. Uh, now that we have the core concepts and we know how the graph traversal works, we can go to a real example. So in, the, in this slide, you see the ad hoc logic for machine learning task classification, meaning that given a target sequence, the label, we want to infer which kind of problem it is in terms of machine learning. So it can be a multi-class problem, it can be a binary classification problem or a regression problem. And what you see from this example from real life, it's it's quite convoluted, can be can be quite convoluted. In the next slide, we see the visions equivalent of this code. So what we do we do in vision, visions is make two typesets, the variable typeset here, denoting the statistical set we've seen before, but with the addition of a binary type for binary classification and define the other type as being a, a typeset as being the problem set. Mm -hmm. And it's quite easy to map logic from the variable side, set to the problem set to actually solve a problem. So on the left, we see the code. Uh, one of the benefits here is that it's easy to uh, reason about and to test. But in the in this slide, we in the next slide, we also see that it's easy to extend. So in this case, we added a Poisson regression type, a negative um, binomial regression, and ordinal regression. And you can see in the pro problem set on the bottom right that it's easily visualized. And adding the type also has a clear place where you would add this logic. Well, in the original slide, it was uh, difficult. Uh, so this is uh, this is the example. And now we proceed with um, the batteries included. Thanks so much, Simon. 
Yes, much like Python, Visions comes batteries included. And what that means is we offer default support for a wide variety of libraries and data structures. Um, these are some of the most common tools used throughout the data science ecosystem. Uh, currently, we support Python and Pandas default data structures out of the box, actually NumPy included in that. Uh, we have active development to bring in support for, for Spark and Dakes, uh, Dask, excuse me, um, with Fakes and uh, SQL Alchemy on the way. We facilitate support for these native library or these libraries natively using a dispatch-based system. Um, some of you may be familiar with this already. Um, others may be familiar with it and under the name kind of overloading from the C landscape. Um, but the basic idea here is we can modify which method is invoked as traversal occurs throughout the data set, uh, throughout the type set um, based on the type of data that's provided in its arguments. So we can write a, a, a custom uh, get operation or contains operation um, for NumPy or Pandas series or tuples, uh, all of which are able to then leverage the specific capabilities of that object. Um, you know, this might mean the, the implicit NumPy D type of Pandas or NumPy um, or the parallelization afforded by Dask or Spark. But Banda, uh, Visions comes with uh, an expansive and, and constantly growing suite of types and typesets that should cover most of the most common use cases in, um, in practice. Uh, so obviously, that means the physical types, integers, floats, strings, um, so on. But even the less common ones, uh, URLs, uh, files, paths, images, date times, shapely geometries, all are available out of the box and are constantly being expanded. Um, we offer a wide range of diagnostic and testing tools for users if they want to um, contribute or develop their own types. You know, one of the inherent challenges with this is, is building something that's robust to all the various types of, of inputs they can receive. And we found having a, kind of a, a toolbox of, of test data to be extraordinarily useful in that endeavor. Uh, we also offer a functional and object-oriented API uh, and built-in plotting capabilities. So, uh, this is in invaluable when it comes to diagnostics. Looking forwards, um, we plan to incorporate Spark and Dask uh, out-of-the-box support in the, the coming future. Uh, obviously, we're always continuing to expand our type library uh, and default type sets, all of which are available the simple import from the package. Uh, and we'll be looking to uh, further integrate into a number of applications. If you're interested, uh, you can find out more on GitHub. So Dylan Profiler backslash visions. Um, everything is you know, accessible on PIP, so you can get started tomorrow. Um, but if you're interested in contributing um, or adding an application or seeing if this could work for your application, uh, please feel free to reach out to us or make a pull request. Both are, are always extremely welcome. Uh, if you're interested in seeing some of the applications it's already integrated in, you can check out Compressio at Dylan Profiler backslash Compressio. Our um, in-memory management and data compression tool for Pandas or Pandas Profiling, uh, one of the uh, highly lauded EDA tools for Pandas. Thanks so much. <laughs>